Good turnaround Tuesday, everybody. Shalom, Kevin. Hi, Patrick, Ash. Put on your earmuffs if it's cold there in the UK, buddy. Hi, Ziggy, Windsor. Everyone doing okay? Hi, Luca. How are you, my trading warrior brother? Forex, Gal, Sabine, Elena, nice to meet you. Okay, so I tweeted earlier, I don't see any turnaround Tuesday trades to fade too much momentum in the Euro. But I just wanted to wrap this up. Last week we had, uh, I was trying to teach about confirmed highs and that they're actionable in Euro pound. And we had these confirmed highs last week after the pound took it on the chin the week before and talked about the scale and trade at 50% back and at 61.8. And as you can see, mission accomplished today. So we've exceeded this uh, 8940 high, which was a confirmed confirmed high. So um, I would bet that you guys are going to start paying attention to both confirmed highs and confirmed lows, and then looking for retracements, formations, moving averages, fibs to look for entries for those highs and lows to be challenged again when they're confirmed. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, it's not as much about the call as it is about a teaching. You know, uh, RSI is not just about looking for divergences, that when you have confirmed highs and lows, the real simple implicator implies that when you have a confirmed high or low, the market will rarely peak or bottom on that. So it kind of gives you a bias of what to do if the market corrects. Okay, hats off to Blake yesterday. Uh, he was talking about uh, there'd be a massive short covering rally in the Euro once this neckline that the whole world was trading was negated. And uh, I think I made a comment, it was just taking too long that Mr. Mark, it's a pretty mean guy. And he doesn't usually accommodate people who miss a breakdown. And he gave them one chance to do it. But when Mr. Market starts giving you too much time to trade the same area, be skeptical because most of the time, Mr. Market's gonna shake out as many participants as possible before the move that the trader is anticipating happens, then most likely without him. So uh, Euro, I don't know what to do with it right now. If you didn't buy it yesterday or get in at, you know, when they started squeezing the people today, you know, the momentum looks like we could go at least towards the 1780 level 18 level but again i can't fade this momentum look at the rsi in the one hour you know it's at 80. so that's nothing that i fade and like blake i don't like to chase uh we're getting some follow-through selling in the s and p's and the n failed again on this rally uh, it's taken a lot of patience. It's got to get going for the breakdown here pretty soon. Uh, Euro yen, too much mo to fade it. Although we are playing in the Euro yen up around the uh, 61.8 level. I'm not ready to do anything there yet. See how we're 61.8 back. Maybe it'll stretch up here in the next few days for the scalp. Again, too much momentum for me to fade. And then I was looking at the Aussie and what Greg was looking for. And Blake put out a pretty cool tweet, showed a deer frozen in the headlights. There are a lot of shorts here. So we did diverge. It may have been enough if the dollar continues to sell off. Um, I still think there might be a chance for one more shot down under 76 towards 580. I believe that's Greg's numbers. And Grega remains bearish on the guppies, so you could use this dollar weakness to short guppies looking for big numbers to the downside. So uh, my tweet today was this, um, and really it's a big advantage. 
this was it. I scanned my charts. Where is it? I scanned my charts and I don't see any turnaround Tuesday trades yet. It's okay because Pipsar, Volgi, Stelios, Grega, and Nick will. So with that being said, Steve, I really uh, don't have that much to share market-wise today. Uh, actually, I'm in actually an it's, it's Blake. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna step in. He had a, he had something. He had a meeting. He had to attend to. He'll be here. Oh, okay, in, buddy. In about 20 right, minutes. You're, you're, you're a good substitute for Steve. Hey, yeah, uh, you you know I'm I'm um, having him uh, or he, he and I agreed um, for him to you know do the do the first part of the analysis just because I'm I'm trying to tackle some of these news events. We have producer prices coming in today, um, okay. but but uh, a couple couple of things. First of all, um, I, I actually got uh, stopped out of my euro yen short and and it, it rallied above this resistance and stopped me out which you know it kind of sucks um and and but i i was as you had pointed out i i and i knew it last night and i and i thought about it last night i'm like you know i should just cut it short because i knew that the euro was going to break through 117 it just i you know and and matter yeah. of fact i i had orders out at 116.45 didn't get hit but i did get long um yeah. fortunately uh, and I was up really early this morning because of that big panel discussion that the ECB had with all the central bankers. But, uh, you know, I, I picked up some euro, which is great because it, it, it's basically compensating for, for my loss in the euro yen. I also picked up the Aussie because the Aussie is, uh, you know, we, we post a false yeah. breakdown. I mean, if, you, if you're a Forex Analytics subscriber, you got that analysis uh, this morning. Uh, before I tweeted out all that stuff, but we we posted a false breakdown. RSI is extremely divergent. Um, yeah. These are major fib levels, and um, we had good data out of Australia last night. So, I, I you know, like if if you're in here, I'll, I'll take you guys over here really quick. I like that tweet with the deer and the the, the eyes were red. <laughs> deer frozen in the headlights. I, it, I assume you're talking about the Aussie yeah. bears. Uh, you guys that are in the chat room, you guys can all say hello. You guys are on Jumbotron right now. Um, the, the, these guys and gals, many of them have been awake. Mo actually, most of the 70 some odd people that are in there right now have been around since early this morning. And I've been buying the Euro and buying the Aussie and, and uh, I'm still short dollar yen, which I'm, I'm still happy about being short dollar yen. I have no problem with that because of the reversal on the Nikkei. But um, yeah, I got stopped out of my Euro yen this morning, but fortunately I've been able to make up lost ground going the other direction. Um, there, there's all, <laughs> Nidish said I'm, I bought Bitcoins. Okay, that's when I have to draw the line and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and remove you guys. <laughs> and Chi was in the Euro yen with me, obviously. So actually there's probably a lot of us that were short the Euro yen. It's just, you know, that, that's one of those things that, I, and, and, I, and I sit here and I look at the Euro yen and I'm like, man, I know that's gonna be right at some point, you know, and it's obviously not right now because as we discussed, um, the problem with this Euro dollar has been that everybody is aggressively short. And your analysis is perf was perfect, Dale, about we spent way too much time down here not fulfilling the upside in the dollar or the downside in the euro. And, and now you, you got traders that are nervous. And, and you have um, like um, FX Macro, which you know is a great follow on Twitter. Uh, and and somebody I personally know. If if uh, one of the probably the biggest traders, by the way, uh, that guy. Just so you guys know, is probably one of the biggest FX traders, uh, uh, independent forex traders in the world. I would. What's his name, him. Blake? I can't say. Oh, okay. So he goes. He's anonymous. Okay. Yeah. You. I'm you try and get him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, 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 doubt yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. I doubt it. I doubt it. You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he's, uh, because he doesn't care, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know right. honestly, he doesn't, you know, it, yeah. it, he, he, but he's been doing this for 30 some odd years anyway. Um, oh. but he, uh, he was saying that, you know, he's saying that the interest rate differentials are really, you know, favoring the U S dollar, but that doesn't matter right now because positioning is all that matters at the moment. 
Um, it, now, at some point, the euro dollar is probably going to go lower. I, I don't think, I, I honestly don't think that the euro dollar is done going lower. I really don't. I, I actually think the euro dollar might get to 118, 119, and then reverse again. It might actually, you know how, you know how this, you know how the um, the the market is. We're probably going to go right past this 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 shoulder, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's clean We're out gonna go like this, squeeze out everybody, and then reverse. It's probably how it's gonna happen. I mean, I'm 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 not gonna play the euro long in anticipation of that right now because I, I'm just targeting up here, okay, around mm -hmm. the 118 at level. The guys in the chat room already know where I'm looking to get out. But uh, I I I I wouldn't be surprised if we went up to 119 and then down. And just to screw everybody, because you know the market likes to put as yeah. much damage on as many people as possible that that's just that's the market now one of the one of the other things that um, that I just want to explain to you guys that came out yesterday is the CTFC positioning data and the dollar traders or speculators are most short the dollars most short the dollars they're most short dollars dot US dollars than, than they've been you know since like uh, you know like like the spring or something and then people are most short yen futures since 2014 and and by the way 2014 if you guys don't remember is when Abe came in so people are most basically long dollar yen that we were right there yeah now there was a reason there was a reason for this because Abe came in with his three arrow approach, you know, um, yada, yada, yada. But right now you're, you're, we're, we're obviously up against resistance and it's obvious it's a big mess up here because my charts are, I, I have to move everything over. But, um, but the fact of the matter is equity markets are so well bid. If they, if they have any, um, sniff of downside, the dollar yen is coming right back down here and positioning is so skewed at this point that it could really hurt the market. Um, and, and that's what I've been playing on. And that's what I've been, you know, I've been doing being on the short side of the dollar yen uh, for the last, you know, two weeks. Now yeah, we have a COT type guest today. Uh, I believe you know him because you, I don't know him. I, I okay. don't know him, but I respect his work. So okay, that's what I meant. Yeah. Movement capital. Yeah. Uh, I've seen his work and I'm like, man, he's got some good, you know, position, positioning data, really good views. I'm, I'm excited to actually um, hear his interview. Uh, so you guys should all stick around for that. It's It should be a really good interview. Anyway, um, uh, what, but what I was discussing here is, you, you know, going back to like the euro dollar, this move right now is just about positioning. That's all it is. It has, it, it, and, it, you know, interest rates, if you want to like take the underlying current of the currency market always like if there's one thing that you can say you can hang your hat on um, in the currency market markets are going to be driven by interest rates and interest rate differentials that's it i mean that's the that's where that's where the that's where the basis and theme of every currency market really originates from so you know whether it's rates are going higher or lower or they're expected to move higher or lower is what's driving the price of currencies underneath it all. All the other stuff is just kind of, you know, noise, if you will. Yeah, you're going to have jobs data and, 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 and inflation data that might move the needle a little bit. But really, as long as rates are moving in one direction and interest rate differentials are moving in one direction, that's overall the theme that's gonna that's gonna take hold. Now again, FX Macro pointed out that the the dollar, um, you know, the the euro dollar should be lower and the dollar should be higher. U.S. dollar should be higher based on interest differentials alone. That's correct right now. But what if something changes? For example, what if you know? the Fed meets in two weeks, what if the Fed uh, really, you know, lets us know that we're done as far as rates go up? 
our rates are going up, but they, you're, they're pretty much going to, they're going to moderate from here and, and, and kind of stay on hold for, 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 for longer. And then you got the ECB that's trying to tighten. That's when interest rate differentials start, and start to tighten again. And then the Euro could really get, it, the, the Euro, this may be a precursor to that in two weeks, who knows? But right now positioning is so skewed of long dollars, short Euro, that we're getting this reaction at the moment. Like I said, I, I don't at this point in time until I get further evidence, I don't think the Euro dollar is going to 125. I think we're gonna be lucky if the Euro dollar gets to 119. However, in a, in a week or, two, or excuse me, in two weeks when the FOMC meets, maybe we, we might have a completely different viewpoint of what the dollar is gonna do based on what interest rates are doing and interest rate differentials, that may shift. All right, but for right now, it's all positioning. So, and positioning means a lot. It means a lot to the market because if you've got everybody lopsided on one side of the boat, it's gonna tip over. And we, we've seen a perfect example of this the last 24 hours. And did you watch the week ahead video, Dale, this week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I and and I hope most of you did, if not all of you. Did. I, I tweeted I tweeted it out there so people would have an edge too. Yeah, you you did it be, even before I had a chance to tweet it out, and and, <laughs> and thank you for that. But um, but I I've been warning you guys that this potentially could happen with the dollar. Um, that you know I I don't I I, I wasn't completely convinced about the dollar being, you know super strong and there's there's a lot of things that factor into the dollar too and it, it, you know a lot of other things on why i don't think the dollars yeah you know, the, the only pair you were negative on and you've uh, stayed that way is cable but you were you know you're skeptical of dollars yeah, yeah and even this morning uh, i was and 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 a few people bought the pound this morning right off of these lows uh, Amanda, who, who's who's very very popular in our chat room, she was uh, she was she covered her pound short like at 130.80 in our chat room. You know about you know 20 some odd pips below where we're at right now, and a lot of people bought it, and I I didn't because I, I'm still a little skeptical about the pound. But frankly, if the dollar is going to continue to weaken against so many currencies, the pound is going to have a very difficult time breaking down as of yet. Now, if if I'm correct, and let's let's say I'm correct here and the euro continues to rally, we're obviously very overbought right now, but we continue to rally to like 118, 119 and then we peak and reverse, then I think at that point I want to start looking at the pound short. But you got to let the dollar this dollar weakness run its course. And unfortunately, unfortunately for the market, the doll the everybody's extremely long the dollar. They're getting their ass is handed to them right now, but they, you know, you had a lot of people that are along the dollar and they're getting stopped out. I mean, we are testing that neckline right now and, and the dollar in, in, in all actuality could see 93 again. Um, and, and I think, yes, Stelios. Hey, how's it going, man? I'm very well. Sorry to interrupt. I, one, no, you know, I asked for you yesterday. You weren't there. Now I don't ask for you and here you are. <laughs> What's up with that? Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm like my ex-wife, you know, always there when I don't want them. Um, no. Uh, um, you said two it. Things I Go ahead. <laughs> two things I wanted to say. One about you talked about the euro dollar. Um, we all need to remember what happens when the euro dollar hits like 118, 120. And that's uh, Draghi and their company just coming out, all guns blazing, being as dovish as you like, because they they certainly don't like that. No. So no. That, yes, that's, that's one true. thing which goes in line with what you said about the euro dollar. And the other thing which I found quite interesting was that <clears throat> today we had the UK inflation data and it came in at 3% year on year, which was 0.1 lower than expected. In fact, all the data items today that came out were all 0.1% lower than expected. It was actually quite funny. Um, and the commentary straight away was, oh, this is really bad because uh, inflation is slowing and uh, they're not going to need to hike as much. And the other times when it was actually over um, overshooting the estimate, it was like, oh, this is really bad because the, the gap is widening between inflation and wage growth. So it's, it, it, it seems funny to me that the, the market is just one way with the commentary, no matter what number comes out. Just, just a quick comment I wanted to say. And, uh, no, it's good. <laughs> it is hey, very interesting. 
Re really quick, um, Rob brings up a good point. Actually, uh, actually, the COT data is not. It, it's it's actually still everybody's still quite long the euro. It's the dollar that really I'm more focused on at the moment, and the dollar obviously feeds into the euro pretty pretty much. And I and I do believe the market still. Uh, I think eighty thousand contracts, if I'm not mistaken. I I don't know the number right over right off the top of my head, but uh, I'll, I'll point it out right here. Uh, here you go. You ready, Rob? And Rob, you're correct. I, I, you, you're actually, you're actually quite correct as far as euro specs. Net short bets on the U.S. dollar fall in the latest week to smallest position since mid-July. That means people have switched from being really short the dollar to not very short the dollar. Does that make sense? So, it, okay. So when you're looking at like a, like, a, like a, a chart. Like let's say euro euro longs are like this. Euro longs are back like this. Now they're still, and let's say the the the, the median line is right here. They're still long, but they're coming off. Does that does that make sense to you? So a lot of that means that a lot of euro longs have already gotten crushed when when the euro went from 120 to 118 or whatever the case is. You, you know what I mean? And so euro specs are still long but they're still coming off and dollar long or dollar shorts are increasing that's 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 actually you're you're, you're correct I, I actually I, I need to clarify things but this is this is the smallest dollar short position since mid-july okay and then also um um the other thing was uh Japanese yen net short bets hit largest since July of 2014. That's a big deal. And that, that's, you know, one of the other things that you got to factor in all this. Because remember, we're, we're all, even though you, you, you look at, you know, the euro or you look at the yen and you go, okay, well, that's the euro, that's the yen. But they are all correlated, right, Stelios? I mean, they're all, you know, intercorrelated to a certain extent. If you get a dollar move across oh, cool. the board, you are going to affect, like, if, if the dollar yen falls aggressively, whether you like it or not, the euro is going to catch some sort of bid. It may not, it, you know, the, the dollar yen could fall 100 pips and the euro may only rally 20, but the euro is going to have some sort of effect because of that and vice versa, you know. So those are the those are the types of things I think, you know, you have to pay attention to, even if it's not euro specific or, um, but you got to look at, okay, what's the overall dollar positioning, you know, that type of thing. Um, and, and, and by the way, we are expected, uh, we have producer prices coming out today. Um, PPI here in the U.S. Now, PPI in the U.S. is um, is is you know inflation data on a producer level. Um, it is expected to come in weaker than last reading, but also a positive read. Um, last month, I think we came in at 0.4 percent. I think we're expecting a 0.1 percent. Let me double check that. Let me make sure I got my numbers on. Yeah, so we're we're expecting a 0.1 percent. You know, if that number goes negative, um, it, and 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 I know that I know everybody's talking inflation. And Stelius, you can you can actually chime in if you want. Everybody's talking inflation, but in, in inflation on a producer level, if we still don't see any signs of that, are we really going to get inflation trickling down to the consumer level, aside from you know energy and 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 you know or prices at the pump, basically? You know, I mean, you know, even food items might have ticked up a little bit, but most of your durable goods are still very low inflationary wise. Yeah, so. I mean, my, it, it, this is it's a tough one because it, with inflation, what really I, I'm, I'm having trouble over the years is that the way they calculated this changed, you know, tens of times. And yeah. if you look at if you look at the the way it's calculated now, there's so many things which are crucial which are completely omitted. So I personally think inflation calculation in most Western countries at the moment is um, is not representative. So you have things like consumer electronics having a huge weighting over um, things like education and health, which actually which actually don't feature at all. So um, you are right that you know it, unless you see an uptick in inflation. Um, you you can't really be talking about oh radically changing uh, monetary policy. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that's such a great point. Like education and health. I mean, those if you inflation on on inf I don't know where about Athens, Greece, but I know in 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 Scottsdale, Arizona. I mean, those premiums are high. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, the, I, pers I personally point. look at look at what I paid for my education. I I was educated in the UK. 
and uh, you know it's gone up you know double digits nearly double digits every year you know so it's um it's not representative and that really annoys me i have to be honest you know it's really annoying because inflation is supposed to show the cost of living you know and you have to put everything in there it's just not just how cheap is the tv becoming or you know stuff you can't actually eat right so, right yeah so, that's um, great great point Stiles. so so at the moment i think most western economies are under reporting what real inflation is and and that's why you see the inflation in the us inflation in europe it's all, un, you know, it's all below two percent, and it's it's not it's not close yet. You know, it's like one and a half percent, so it's not there. You know, the UK is the only the only outlier, and they got they got an inflation jump because of the depreciating currency. Uh, but um, you know, it's uh, you know, I, I, it's one of the things that I argue most about inflation, you know, with friends and uh, and, <laughs> and other people, and I just think it's completely wrong. Makes it makes a ton of sense. Um, well, I, I know I know Steve is coming in to join us here shortly because uh, I'm, I'm going to be uh, leaving you guys to um, to, uh, to 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 trade some of this news event. Um, there's there's a couple uh, tight or, or there's a couple of tight formations like the U.S. dollar Mexican peso is tightening up really 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 tight here. Uh, I, I'm keeping an eye on this one. And then also, you know what's interesting, Stelios, you got the, the strength of the euro, but you, th these Nordic currencies like the US dollar Swedish krona and the US dollar Norwegian krona are still weak. I, yeah. I, w I wonder why that is. Do you, do you have any explanation for that? Sweden, Sweden is simple, is that they, we had uh, weak inflation data today, and they are they shouldn't be there, but they're kind of correlated, the two. So you've got Swedish krona suffering and the Norwegian krona, which I'm long off and I'm really frustrated, um, is also I dropping. I didn't, even see, I didn't see the inflation data out of Sweden. I must have missed that. I, you know. Yeah, today it came out today, and it was uh, year on year 1.7 percent versus 1.8 expected. Uh, so marginal miss. It was small miss, but still a miss. And it seems like the market is looking for any kind of excuse to sell Nordic currencies. I have no idea why. Got it, I see I'm, it. I'm sticking with my Norway long, but I really, really don't understand it. Very, very frustrating at the moment. And you know, they're getting to levels. I think the Swedish krona broke out of a, a pretty, um, pretty big resistance uh, today. Some, it, uh, it's trying. Yeah, it's this is a big downtrend line. It's it's still up against the the six one eight uh, here. Yeah. Um, Steve, are you are you around this morning? Hey, mate. Hey, okay. It looks like Steve just uh, just popped in, and uh, Steve, I was covering. I, I'm going to flip it over to you, but I was just covering the um, the 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 dollar with Stelios, and we were talking about inflation data, um, and uh, you know we did cover the euro and the Aussie, and uh, you know the yen. To a certain extent, but um, but you know, we do have producer prices coming up in a couple minutes, so I got to get ready for that. Um, and uh, and and I hope you guys have a great uh, interview. Dale, have a great interview with uh, Movement Capital. I'm gonna I'm gonna tune in for that in about uh, 30 minutes. Okay. Good luck on the number, Blake. Thanks, guys. Have a good, good one. Good luck, mate. Bye bye. Stay low. Hey, nose for Hey, Dale. Yes, sir. Stay, stay, stay low. Did you cover? Um, Mornings really covered, uh, in, you know, uh, what's going on with inflation data. data. We, we uh, covered a little bit of the UK. Um, so, uh, what what in particular did you uh, were you looking at? German data, and uh, we also had um, CPI from Spain that actually undershot somewhat the expectations we, we, we i did not personally cover anything about germany or uh, or spain we didn't talk about that so you can talk about it okay um okay uh we had we had german uh, gdp uh, that went above expectations as you see here it was 0 0.8 uh, in comparison to forecast 0 0.6 everybody knows that germany is the steam engine of uh, the eurozone so that that was obviously you know a, a data print that uh, affected uh, you know um, qu quite much um, you know the outlook for the eurozone and um, the um, the expectations uh, for the eurozone's uh, GDP. So I think you know this was a major uh, euro positive. Um, I don't know if Blake had a look at it, but um, until we uh, until we get a print within a few seconds, we also had a very good bounce in the euro yen. We have been monitoring this; it had been tested, uh, it had been testing during the past few days, 
a possible neckline of a head and shoulders formation, or anyhow, no matter how you see it, it was a range. Uh, we are rebounding does, that uh, as well. Does today change your dollar view, Steve? Is it enough? Well, that's, that's uh, strong, first, numbers, strong numbers out of the US. Yes. PPI for final demand rises 0 0.4. In October, services increases 0 0.5, goods advance 0 0.3. Uh, so, uh, so month on month, it's 0 0.4, in, uh, with uh, 0 0.1 uh, being the estimated. So, yeah, that's that, that's a strong print. That's a strong print. Let's see what let's see what the euro is doing. Not much. Let's see what the USD yen is doing. <laughs> Actually, almost nothing. So it's uh, year on year is 2.8 in comparison to. To 2.4, so it's 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 a very good print. But so far, the USD yen does not show uh, any real movement. Actually, the market is almost not responding to the print. Um, let me just say here that the PPI is always considered to be um, like an um, uh, early indication of CPI because you know the producer prices index. Uh, you know, we'll always pass it through. Yeah, exactly. We'll always spill over because you know, if producers have to pay more to get whatever materials they need to to, to make products, they're going to pass that through to the final price. So that you, you know, in theory, that passes to the consumer with some kind of a delay. And so, you know, uh, like strong PPI prints usually um, uh, show that CPI is also going to pick up. In the following months, and as we very well know, uh, um, the Fed specifically has um, two mandates. One of them is full employment, and the other one is price stability. So we we know that uh, having to do with employment, the U.S. has been doing very good. I mean, the unemployment rate uh, is you know extremely low, almost at a record low. Although the underlying data are not so great, but still. The unemployment data, you know, as a whole, are considered to be good. So, if we get a hotter CPI, then there is absolutely nothing uh, left to stop the Fed from, uh, you know, uh, hiking rates um, in the future to resume hiking rates in the future. So, in theory, a strong PPI print is um, is, is very hawkish uh, for, uh, you know, the Fed's. Um, um, uh, behavior, let's say, and uh, um, monetary policy in, in the future. But uh, as I said, so far we're not seeing almost uh, any response from the market. I find it quite weird, actually. Um, okay, so um, in expectation to see if you know, the market is going to respond uh, with some delay, um, l l let's have a look. I'm going to have a look at questions and let's see. Uh, what Blake hasn't answered yet, and um, or Dale, you want to help me? Uh, what what did Blake speak about? So I don't I don't say the same things because I was off. Dale, by the way, use this Swiss is one of the person. So before Dale comes back, I just want to say, Luca, sorry about Italy not uh, making it to the World Cup, but you guys have won it so many times that uh, it's. Time for somebody else to win it. <laughs> no, that, that was extremely sad, actually. I, I always support yeah, Italy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the World Cup without Italy, but anyway. Yeah, it isn't. That, that, that's for sure, actually. And uh, too bad for Buffon not playing his last Mundial. Anyhow. Um, okay, use this Swiss, by the way. We, we are seeing a pop in the Euro USD, and you know, knowing the very strong inverted correlation. Obviously, we're also seeing some weakness from the USD Swiss, but, and you know that that should be taken, um, you know, in combination with what the euro is doing and what the expectations are from the euro. I have to say that the reaction from the highs uh, from the USD Swiss, um, you know, we had two scenarios here. You know, the second scenario is playing out. Is not. I mean, the price action we see here is definitely not impulsive to the downside for now. So. Uh, I still believe that the USD Swiss remains bullish. Obviously, um, you know, a pullback is, is underway. Um, one first area of support is this area that I have indi indicated here, which is 9860, uh, 9870, this area. And, you know, uh, below that, we, we have to go to the 9754. Now that we have some short term top in place, we can also draw a fib. Here Looks like a flag to me, Stephen. Yeah. And also, it's been giving up uh, 
compared to Euro strength, the weakness in Swiss has been grudgingly yes, giving and, it up. Yes, and you know, the, the, reason, the reason is this, the Euro Swiss, because the Euro Swiss is in a slow uptrend, but it's, it's an uptrend, okay? Uh, the Euro Swiss, by the way, since we mentioned it, also seems oh, yeah. to be breaking out once again. Right line. Right? So we expected a move higher from there that already happened. And as it seems, you know, as you see, since we started this uptrend, you know, the, the whole Euro Swiss story is always move higher, consolidate, move higher, consolidate, move higher, consolidate, move higher, consolidate, move higher, consolidate. So this is a clear, clear uptrend. And we have absolutely no reason to believe that it's over. Okay, absolutely no reason. I think that up to 120, there is no real resistance. So unless you know, something happens with the global environment or with Eurozone and we have some big risk of coming through the markets, uh, that, that's also going to be probably like geopolitical or something, you know, going very wrong with the economy or whatever, which doesn't seem to be the case, uh, especially at the moment, because all the Eurozone data since, uh, you know, quite a long time ago have been uh, positive, better than expected, as good as expected, but, you know, we, we, we're, we're definitely seeing a series of you know good data coming through the market i really don't see the reason uh, why the euro swiss uptrend is going to uh, to stop it's slow it's it's definitely not a fast mover but uh, you know uh, it's 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 definitely it's definitely creating uh, higher lows since february okay and you know that's not over so as long as the euro swiss remains in an uptrend the use the swiss um, is going to be performing better to the uh, to the downside um, let's say it's going to be falling softer than the euro usd is going to be ascending so even if we if we have like a, a final push for the euro usd even to new highs there is a very good chance that we're going to see a divergence with, with the USD Swiss. Anyhow, the next resistance for the Euro uh, USD is the 118.50. Uh, that, that's going to be some strong resistance, uh, but definitely the uh, scenario of uh, head and shoulders formation is invalidated. Um, anyhow, we had indicated plenty of times that the move lower was undeniably not an impulsive one. I mean, we never, ever had an, an acceleration. We only had like a couple of two, three candles that were strong. But other than that, uh, it, it was like a slow grind lower. And you never, never see big moves in, in that fashion. Okay. So when the market is really strong or when the market is really weak, the impulsive characteristics, uh, you know, uh, on a technical uh, formation are, are very, very clear. And we had none of that. So uh, the fact that the Euro USD is popping is not like a big surprise. I was expecting that it might make it down to 114.50, and I was more than willing to buy down there, but doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. Okay, <laughs> the weird thing, and that's another thing for uh, people that are long the USD yen uh, to keep in mind, is that we got we got some good dollar data. And the USD yen is actually resuming the move lower after it got a pop, a, a pop higher earlier on the day. We're actually moving lower. We're now in negative territory for the day. So, uh, you know, this is another indication that being long the USD yen is probably not a good thesis at the moment. Okay, because... And Steve, uh, and yeah. sorry to interrupt. This was also with some really more dovish comments from uh, Bank of Japan today. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I seen, I've seen the comments overnight. I think even yeah. Blake uh, tweeted about them. Uh, you know, that the commentary that's coming through the, uh, the BOJ now is almost... Uh, you know, it's, it, it's actually extreme. I mean... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't see what more they could say from. No, there's you nothing know, more they could say, Stelio. Nothing more. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I think there isn't anything on the book that they haven't even that they haven't already used, honestly. 
and they you need know, to this play is... the uh, they need to play the Prince song when doves cry. <laughs> the great song. Yeah, yeah but yeah, they... honestly, I think there is, I think there is nothing left for them to say or do. Nothing, nothing. I mean, they, they couldn't have been more vocally dovish, and you know, there, there is absolutely no question since. Uh, Abe and Kuroda uh, took over. Uh, Abe's prime minister, Kuroda's uh, the central banker. The BOJ has done like everything. They've been buying uh, ETFs. They've been buying stocks. They've been buying billions, uh, trillions actually, of uh, uh, of government bonds. Uh, I really don't know what else there is for them to do. Uh, and you know that's. That's a little bit worrying, and that's something that the market definitely notices, right? Because when uh, when the response to what you're doing starts um, having so much diminishing effects, as we see now in the case of Japan, you know, you really have to start wondering what's the next step. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, if if they, you know, it, it makes them quite helpless actually when they do when they. When the time comes for them to really do something to help the currency, it, it just looks like they can't, you know, nothing works. So yeah, it's, I'm, pretty, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure they're going, to invent, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're going to invent something stupid to do. I mean, you know how it is. Yeah, uh, yeah they, 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 they seem to have uh, on, almost an unlimited uh, amount of imagination in uh, creating new tools for monetary policy. But I still believe that no matter what they... Um, uh, the, what, what they make, what they do next, Stelio, is going to have a very limited half-life as well. That, that's what yeah. I think. Yeah, most likely, yes. yes. And like Blake, Blake keeps saying over and over again, if all this can't bring dollar yen higher, it has to go lower. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, you know I, the, yeah, the path of least resistance, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a feeling, you know, for for some time now that you know, the yen has to depreciate. You know, with all these things they're saying and all that. But now I'm really not sure anymore. I think the path of least resistance, at least for the short term, is down, and then we'll see. Look, by the way, saying Chinese ten years uh, breaks four percent. Watch junk bonds market for more weakness uh, that can give another leg down in stocks. Yeah, uh, Luca, you know something, the market has been ignoring for a big period of time anything, anything that indicates that things are not so rosy, right? And at some point, usually what happens is like an invisible hand or a trigger or some event makes the market realize and notice all of these things that it had been ignoring for a long period of time suddenly all together and that usually creates even a, a, a short-term perfect storm and usually that is why we have the saying up with the L, uh, up with the escalator down with the elevator that's why usually sell-offs are brutal in comparison to uh, moves uh, higher so for example you see we've been in, a, in an uptrend in the SPX for example since that, that, that has had almost zero pullbacks since August, like we had like zero pullbacks in August. I mean, we haven't really pulled back more than two or three days. And even when that has happened, it has been extremely limited. And so we've, we've been grinding higher, for example, since the middle of August. We're currently roughly, let's call it uh, uh, several months later. I mean, we're in the middle of uh, November and we've moved from 2,412 to, let's call it 2,580. Okay, you can easily see, let's say that, you know, a sell-off starts now, you can easily see retracing half of that range within five days. Because that, that's, that's, that's how things work. Okay, so people should be very, very, very careful, very careful. Because, you know, once the market runs out of reasons to rally, even this slow creeping rally and, you know, a, a few bad news start creeping through, um, you can easily see like, a, you know, something that took the market like four or five months to gain to be given back within a week, two weeks. Okay, so there is really no reward to risk ratio to be long up here. No, no whatsoever. And... I'm not calling a top, right? I, I mean, 
even if we start moving lower from here, which I believe that we will soon start doing so, I'm going to be viewing this as a uh, well-expected correction, so I don't get misinterpreted. Okay, let's let's have a uh, let's have a look at a few questions. Uh, DAX. Let's have a look at the DAX. The DAX was actually the first index that, that rolled over, and as you see, the DAX keeps ignoring the positive news because it focuses more at the moment in Euro USD being strong, right? I mean, we've talked about the inverse correlation of uh, DAX, and I, I warned several days ago that, listen, be careful, the DAX has stopped responding to Euro weakness uh, by, by getting stronger, and that was one of the first indications. That's why you need to pay attention to correlations, because, you know, the DAX was, was moving higher following the rest of the stock indices, the vast majority of the global stock indices, US stock indices, etc., and being helped by the fact that uh, the euro was even slowly but weakening. And at some point it stopped doing so, although the euro had not started strengthening. So, you know, if we get a couple of bad news in the market or some risk aversion in conjunction with the fact that the euro USD is now moving higher, you might see this extremely, extremely important support level because this, this support area that I've marked here is like very, very important simply because it was a resistance here. So it marked a short term top there. And then uh, we uh, the market respected the support, you know, for several days in a row. So, you know, if we actually break below there, it's not that we, you know, ruin the potential of, an, of a continuation of the uptrend at some point. But definitely, like that's a little, uh, you know, crack in the armor of a very, 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 very strong bull market. So, uh, you know, this this area, let's say, let's call it between 12,850 and 12, uh, like 1,200 and uh, 12,950. So these 100 handles. Um, you know, this this is a very, very important area, and I'm, I'm really closely monitoring. If we rebound from here, you know, that's that's fine. Uh, the bull trend re remains, you know, intact, intact even in, in, uh, in the short-term view. But if we actually break below there, then we're looking at a correction that might become more complex than that, because simply if we break below there, then I would expect that we would at least get one more leg lower doing something like this, okay, or something like this. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm closely monitoring this level. We're quite close. Um, and I think this, this will also, you know, lead the way perhaps as, it, as, as the DAX topped first, perhaps a break below there will lead the way in other stock markets, stock indices as well. Something else I wanted to show here uh, in the FTSE. We still have the potential of a double top here if we don't manage to hold this this area of support that we're testing as we speak. So there it is. So I think the FTSE is in danger of resuming lower. Depends on what the cable is going to do as well. The cable once again today started, you know, quite weak. But I have to say that once again. It's, you know, holding the triangle. It's holding, most importantly, the 130 uh, support level. So uh, although I remain short uh, the cable and I'm like almost almost flat, I'm a little bit in the money, I mean negligible in the money, I have to say that we, we still have no technical break here. So, uh, you know, we need to be more patient with that. The fact, though, that the cable remains near the lows and on the other hand the euro is strong has already created a breakout in the euro pound okay and although we expected that a break below there would uh, you know extend the bearish move this level held down here and we we've now broken above this descending trend line and that's definitely something that brings bullish implications, right? Because 
as long as we hold this area, perhaps you know uh, the the bullish move can uh, sustain itself. Um, so if I was short the euro pound, which I'm not, and I wasn't, uh, I haven't been. I was back here in this leg of the downtrend, but afterwards it was too choppy. The room was advised to be long for a week. Uh, that 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 was a good advice, uh, Dale. And uh, let me tell you something: we we still have no indication that you know the bullish move is resuming because I have to remind you that we came out of a strong bullish move here. But I can tell you one thing for sure: is that at the moment this structure has no, nothing bearish to it. So at best best case scenario, we we will continue to be choppy at the rough range, let's say between zero ninety. 50 and 087 uh, but we might even break out to the upside so definitely uh, the structure you know tells me that you shouldn't be short at the moment we we need more evidence uh, you know to know what to do here but definitely if I had to be something at the moment uh, would be uh, you know uh, I mean other than neutral would be bullish okay so be careful if you're short. Be careful if you're short because we really have no indication that the next move is down at the moment. And you see how how nicely support resistance areas hold. I mean, we had this area, uh, you know, since some time ago, and it actually held here very nicely. And this is also another indication that very very big candles and very very big candle formations do matter because we got that extremely strong day there. And despite showing weakness for the next two, three days, we never broke below it. And this was also a huge morning star formation, which the market kept respecting because we never dropped below it. Okay, so this is another indication why candlesticks do matter here as well. Okay, this was a dark cloud cover. It was worth, you know, hundreds of pips uh, of a downside. This, I'm, I'm just showing you now why we have a separate tab in candlesticks. And we are fully aware that many of you, many of our subscribers, you know, just watch at the traffic light and do not read every day at the candlestick analysis. And many days the candlestick analysis is very boring because let's say you're going to have just a black candle. So the candlestick analysis is going to say we had a black candle today. But I'm showing you why for us? Because we've built an algorithm uh, in Forex Analytics which takes into account every single tab we have, its short-term and its long-term bias. I'm showing you why candlesticks are important because strong candlestick formations here, we had an evening star formation. That marked the top. Here we Steve had a more... Nibble, Steve is quick. Pay attention to his candlesticks. <laughs> Here we had a morning star formation. It has been good for a low, right? We had a dark cloud cover here. We had a we had an outside uh, black candle here. As you see, the the big candlestick formations, in the vast majority of the cases, are important. That's why we pay so much attention to them. It doesn't mean that every single candlestick on a chart matters. They don't. If, if it's a simple white candle or a simple black candle or whatever, you know, it means nothing. But you know, some days the candles tell you a lot that you need to know about about the market. Today's candle, for example, so far, let's say that we close the day where we are at the moment, would have been a Maruboso closing white, which shows, and a long one, which shows that not only the bulls were in control, but they managed to close uh, the day right at the highs. That shows you a market that has uh, momentum. A market that it's quite unlikely that the next day is going to roll over and die. How about relabeling it? Uh, maybe a move uh, ABC up to 91 and then resume the downtrend. It can happen. It can happen. Yeah. It can happen. Although that's going to be a flat. What you're mentioning, because I need to show you here, Dale, that this was a lower low than this one. Yeah. So this can end up being a flat. You're absolutely right about it. it can be an A, B, and a C at a bigger a b c structure that can be the case that's why i didn't say that this market is bullish if you heard me right i said that 
I'm neutral, and if I had to, to be something, it would be bullish, at least in the short term. So I'm not yeah. convinced that we're headed to new highs, but I'm definitely convinced that in the short term, there is absolutely no reason to be bearish. You are right, Rob. Uh, COD, uh, Rob says the following. Wait, wait, wait. COD positioning is still super long euro. Uh, oh, you said that probably uh, Blake answered because you said thanks, etc. Yeah, you know, it's yes, but sentiment has already deflated somewhat. I mean, if I pull out yesterday's DSI report, let me bring it in front of me, I can tell you that... Yeah, Blake didn't address that. Ah, okay. The yeah, it's it's currently at 46. The DSI is at 46, which is exactly mid-range. Okay, so that means that we definitely have some room to the upside, having to do with sentiment and positioning. Okay. Ducks recovered for a reef. Uh, okay, USD on positions you said you covered. Could you look Dax and Nikkei? Yeah, Nikkei. Let's have a look at the Nikkei. Uh, did uh, did Blake cover the Nikkei, Dale? Only in regards to the yen. Okay. Uh, okay. Nikkei so far is holding the red ascending channel that we for a little bit over of uh, you know overshot to the upside. So for me, this is quite an important level because if we break below it then we've broken below both the channels the one, one that led to the overthrow and you know the one that led the uh, the uptrend uh, since the lows in the wedge um, and you know that will open uh, the potential for more downside my intuition tells me that the nikkei is not done uh, selling off and my intuition tells me the same about the dax and my intuition I, i'm not changing what i said yesterday tells me that the uh, we, we should see some risk off in the U.S. indices as well, and we should see that rather soon. Okay. Pound pairs. Sure, let's cover the pound pairs. Uh, more people asking about the pound pairs. Okay, let's have a look at them. Okay, having to do with cable itself, I already covered it. There is not much else to say here, but let's have a look at the pound Aussie, the pound Kiwi, and the pound, pound card. Okay, the good news about the bulls in the pound Aussie is that uh, we've been in an uptrend since we broke out of this wedge and out of this channel. The bad news is that lo this looks like an ascending wedge. The good news with being if it's an ascending wedge is that most likely we should see another push to new highs, let's say towards 175. The bad news in case that happens is that it's likely that's going to be terminal. So um, I have to tell you that the price action has been rather choppy um, and I wouldn't be having a position here, but if I was forced to have a position here, it would probably be long in the short term. Okay. Other than that, as I said, I think there are better trading opportunities out there. Pound Kiwi, I think looks more bullish uh, because we had that major breakout from this uh, multi-month, uh, more than a year actually, bottoming pattern. Um, this also looks possibly like a bull, uh, I wouldn't call it a flag, like a pennant. And, you know, it, it looks more bullish to me, but still um, I'm not convinced, you know, that the corrective move lower is done. But, you know, I, I see it more in a, in a more positive note here. So uh, if I had to be long one of the two, it would be Pound Kiwi. Okay, I can tell you that much. Let's have a look at the Pound card as well. Okay, as you see the Pound card, uh, one bad new, you know, one piece of bad news is that we had a nice inverted head and shoulders. It worked out for a little bit. Now we fell, fell back below it. So obviously that invalidates the uh, specific pattern. On the other hand, we're holding this 165, let's call it 80 support area. So, you know, I can't turn bearish as well. Somebody can even see this as, as a retest of this triangle because somebody could have viewed this as a triangle. 
Uh, so, you know, I think price action is mixed here as well. Not much to do, really. I mean, I mean better trading opportunities, more clean uh, pairs out there. And, you know, the reason is very simple. Even if you look at it uh, from a very basic perspective, the pound has been rather weak lately. And undoubtedly, the Aussie and the Kiwi have been weak. So, why would you be looking to find, you know, between weak currency pairs, which is the weakest one? I think it's, you know, it's it's always smarter to look what has been overperforming, what has been underperforming, and be long, you know, a currency pair that has been strong against something that has been, you know, weak, or short something that has been, you know, weak against something that has been strong. So I think the pound Aussie, pound Kiwi don't fit that criteria at the moment. It's more more or less trying to bet which is going to be the weakest. Thank you. Uh, oh, we have more questions. We're going to look at them. To, um, we have a question about the USD rubble. Tomorrow I'm going to speak about all the exotic pairs, actually, because we, we, we've had some, you know, very interesting days there. We, we, we've had very interesting price action there. So tomorrow we're going to look at them. I think some 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 very good trading opportunities, uh, you know, are lying there, and we're going to show levels for the vast majority of them. Good cheese. Okay, uh, the USD sec. The, the, there's, there's a friend asking about the USD sec, um, and I have to tell you that it still fits the criteria of you know higher highs. Um, and higher lows so far, so it remains in an uptrend, okay? And I think that's it. We have no indication of a reversal yet. We've broken out of this channel, so I think it looks good. It still looks good. And the next major, major area of uh, resistance is quite far away still. Okay, Dale, enjoy the interview, my friend. I'll Thank see you, you Steve. Tomorrow. Nice, anal nice analysis. Okay, Adam, I'm making you the presenter. Looking forward to seeing your screen and hearing your voice and learning about how you deal with and interpret the COT. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. How are you today, buddy? I am pretty good. Uh, how, how about you? Good. It's very nice to meet you. And I want to thank you for taking time out today out of uh, this uh, somewhat busy session yeah. to, to address us and uh, I know that you want to talk about COT. Uh, I'm always interested, though, Adam, on how, what was your foray into the business? How did you get started? Uh, where were you at point A? Now you're yeah. at point B. How did it happen for you? Yeah, so for me, um, when I went to college my freshman year, I got really interested in you know trading and investing. And so I read a bunch of books because at that point, you know, your freshman year, um, you're not taking anything really super specific to your major. So I was reading a lot freshman, sophomore year. And then um, after my sophomore year, one thing I was sort of concerned about is, you know, I, I had all these friends and we were in all these different degree paths and we didn't really know what, what that you were going to do. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not necessarily that, but like, for example, you know, I was a finance undergrad, but I didn't know if I actually wanted, you know, the day-to-day -day life of, of somebody in that industry. And so between sophomore and junior year, I took off and I worked for a year at a hedge fund local to me. And they were sort of more of a CTA, uh, like a commodity trading advisor. And it was a good are, role because are, it was Are you from Chicago? No, 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 no. I'm from uh, the deep south, Mississippi. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they were more of a CTA and... Uh, it was good because it wasn't like a, you know, like a basic role, like getting coffee or something. I had one job at that uh, company, and that was to help him make sense of the COT report. And so I worked on that for a really long time. Um, and basically, the goal of it was to, you know, learn how to create a systematic model and, you know, implement it into a live trading environment. And so, wow, uh, what a great, wow, you were, you know, you had a guardian angel looking over you. I mean, compared yeah. to, compared to like a lot of people, you know, they say, well, I want to learn about trading. They go the internet. You went to yeah. a pro and then you learned and helped him with a valuable tool. What a great start. 
Yeah, that was uh, that definitely helped a lot because I mean the internet's good, but you've got to have the uh, I don't filter. Know, the sense. Yeah, you need the filter. a filter. <laughs> And so anyways, uh, you know, worked for him, uh, quickly realized I did like, you know, the the day-to-day -day waking up, doing that. And so went back to university, finished my degree. And then the day that I graduated, um, I opened up my investment firm. It's an RIA. It's a registered investment advisor. And, okay. um, and so I managed money for friends and family. Uh, and that was two, a little over two years ago. So I've been doing that for two years. And then on the side, uh, basically, I maintain a lot of free websites for traders or investors that try to take a complex uh, topic, break it down, and then make it look visually, you know, interesting and actionable. And so the one thing that I focus on a lot uh, is COT, is positioning. And so, um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of where I'm at now. Okay, very good story. And uh, okay, so. Why don't we get into, you sent me some messages, some DMs yeah. yesterday, and and uh, you're the boss. I'm just <laughs> the host. So uh, wherever you want to go, I could follow you, buddy. Cool. Okay. So uh, the CFT report, in short, um, is a weekly report put out by the CFTC that outlines how different types of traders are positioned in the markets. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that there are a lot of different COT report. So for example, this one is called the Legacy Report. Um, they started releasing the report in 1986, and this was the format they started. And unfortunately, this is the format a lot of traders still use. So it's really basic. It only has um, two main categories, non-commercial and commercial. So uh, around the mid-2000s, the CFTC uh, got some pressure, and they're like, hey, you know, there's a bunch of different types of traders now. We want more detail. And so they started releasing what's called the disaggregated report. And this is what the uh, disaggregated report looks like for gold. So we got a bunch of different categories, and let me walk you through them. So okay. uh, first over here, we've got uh, producers and users. So, you know, for example, for gold, a producer would be like a gold miner who wants to sell futures to hedge. So let's say that you're a gold miner and you're sitting there and let's say the price of gold is high, something like $1,700, $1,800 an ounce. And you know that you don't have a lot of gold to sell right now, but six months from now, you're going to have production coming online and you think the price of gold is attractive now and you want to lock it in. So how do you hedge and lock it in? You sell futures. Right. Uh, but on the flip side of that, so that's sort of the producer uh, side of the equation. On the user side of the equation, let's say you're you're a company like uh, Starbucks or like a coffee manufacturer, and you know that in a couple months you're going to need to get a ton of coffee uh, for your production process. You need to buy it, right? So you're a user. So how you hedge is you buy coffee futures so that if you know coffee futures go up 20% in the interim, you've already locked in the lower prices. So that's sort of the the hedging side of it. Whenever people talk about producers and users, but there are I mean, a bunch that's of the whole reason that futures markets were developed. Exactly. Exactly. All you I know, mean, it all wasn't just are, to gamble yeah. and speculate. It, was, it had a legitimate economic reason. Yeah. And it's uh, it's been interesting to watch that uh, like 20, 30 years ago, when you look at the open interest of these markets, um, who dominated it were the hedgers in commodities. But as time has progressed and his um, like commodities as an asset class have gotten more popular, you've seen speculators sort of be a, a bigger player. And so that's sort of why I make a point to pay attention to speculator positioning just because they're a bigger, you know, person in the market. Anyways, though, so we've covered, you know, producers, users. Now we got another category over here called swap dealers. So swap dealers actually can initiate a position for like a bunch of different reasons. It's not so clear cut of who they actually are because they can sort of change uh, depending on the market. And for that reason, I completely exclude analysis of swap dealers because uh, it's more opaque. You don't really know what you're looking at. But I definitely do pay attention to the other speculator categories. So we got uh, managed money, other reportables, and non-reportables. So money managers are... Um, Typical fund traders, be it like a hedge fund, a CTA, uh, other reportables are other large traders that are trading above the reporting limit for each contract. Uh, so they're they're basically trading large size. 
and then oh, you mean not, like like me exactly dale and so yeah. uh and so <laughs> the last category is uh is non-reportable so that's small speculators uh those are people trading under the uh the positioning limit so another so thing is that still even with the new report adam uh um with the category that you're most looking to fade no no so a lot of people a lot of people say at the beginning they're like okay pay attention to the small speculators it's you know the dumb money fade them so i've right. run I've run a lot of analysis on that, and I've found that it's basically a wash. Uh, sometimes they get lucky, and sometimes their positioning's right, and then sometimes, right. uh, you know, they're not. And so I personally really don't pay attention to small speculators. I do look at speculators in the aggregate. And since the the money managers and the other reportables tend to, you know, be trading larger size and stuff, they and they have right. bigger positions. That sort of dictates spec positioning. And I so um, another thing worth knowing is that wow. with the CFT report. Uh, there's two ways to slice it. So over here with the legacy report, uh, this only covers futures positions. And the disaggregated report, um, they also offer options and futures. So they convert options positions on like a delta equivalent basis to futures. So all you need to know is it's just a more comprehensive report. You need to look at options positioning too. And so, um, and so that's sort of an overview of the different types get of traders. All right. Do you get good tells from, I know a lot of option traders look for, you know, size to give them some type of um, potential market tell for direction by the yeah. kind of size coming in. Do you get, and you know, uh, options are like relationships, 90% of them expire worthless. Uh, do you notice yeah. that with the option positions, that really the goal is for them to expire worthless and they'll pin it near an important strike? No, I mean, to be honest, you can't really uh, discern that because the options, it's just all rolled into one number. So you can't really figure out, you know, what's a okay. future position, what's an options position. But, um, but the next thing I sort of wanted to, to talk about is, so this is just a current report. So like this is the most recent COT report for gold um, and one, one thing to know is that COT is always as of Tuesday's close and it's released on Friday. So there is a little bit of lag with it. So you have to be, uh, I don't know, you have to recognize that. But anyways, this is a current report. So you're probably looking at this and let's look at like gold producers and users right now. So right now they are long 35,000 contracts and they're short 213,000 contracts. So you might look at that at face value and be like, oh my God, you know, they've got a huge you know, net short position. Well, it's really important to go look at the past for this to see how that position has changed over time. So um, this is the actual uh, historical file to download. So obviously you look at this, you're like, oh, this makes no sense to me. It's a ton of data. And so here's sort of how I walk through making sense of it. So we got gold, we got, uh, you know, different weeks with the rows, We've got open interest, and then we've got the producer and user long position and sh short position from that sort of snapshot report I showed you. So the right. first step to make sense of it is you got to make a net number. Um, so this is sort of just longs minus shorts. But and now a lot of people stop here. A lot of people just look at net um, positioning, be it for speculators or producers and users. I do not like to do that because think about this. Right now, so producers and users are net short 177,000 contracts. What And right now, open interest is like 730,000. What if over the past two years, open interest has doubled from, let's say, 350,000 to you know 700,000? What that means is that a net position of like net short 177,000 would look massive, you know, relative to three, five years ago. But since open interest has grown, uh, it's really not that huge of a position now. And so all these futures markets, they, they both expand and shrink. So some of them, their open interest explodes. Like the biggest examples would be um, VIX futures right now. And so you can't just compare a net positioning number for VIX futures uh, relative to what it was five years ago because the market's different. It's a much bigger market. Vice versa, some markets shrink, like uh, actually NASDAQ futures and Palladium. And so if you're comparing like a, a net positioning number three years ago to now, the market's a lot smaller. Uh, and so that, that position looks bigger than it other would, would have been. 
And so, so you do, now, so you do need a historical perspective as uh, three to five years, um, a good number to go back to. And well, here's what compare. I do. Yeah. So the first step is you take your net position and then you need to just scale it by open interest. So you take this number, the net position, you just divide it by the open interest. And so this is the net producer and user position for gold as a percentage of open interest. And so right now it's negative 24%. Um, but what you need to know is that these numbers can be different extremes in different markets. So for example, right now, you know, gold producers are net short 24, 24% of the OI in gold, but, um, and that actually is sort of extreme, but you could go over to a market like crude oil where um, that, that's unheard of. That's a super net short position. And so what's extreme uh, in crude oil might be a totally different figure. And so to sort of normalize positioning between all these contracts, I just create a percentile. And so a percentile takes the current value and looks at its range relative to the past five years. So for example, with gold, okay. um, the five year, the most net long gold producers and users have ever been over the past five years is a positive 1.8% of the open interest. And that was around right here in, um, in like mid 2013. Um, now the most net short they've ever been was around negative 30% of the open interest. And that was back over the past five years, that was back in like mid or late 2012. So you might notice that you're like, okay, wow, producers and users, they've never really been uh, super net long. They've always really been net short. Why is that? And it's because uh, uh, commercial producers dominate the open interest of uh, the producer and user category. Think about it this way. It's because uh, commodity producers have a lot more risk on the table. So let's say, let's say you are a coffee company and you're a user and you, you need to buy coffee futures to fix the price of your future inventory. If coffee futures go up, or if you know a livestock futures go up, a lot of commodity users can pass that price on to the end consumer, right? So that's why you know grocery store prices can can you know go up. But if you are a commodity producer um, and your livelihood depends on getting a certain price for corn or wheat or gold, you stand to lose a lot more if the price of a commodity drops a lot between now and the time you go to market to sell your inventory. And so knowing that producers have a lot more to, to lose, you see that producers right. are the dominant hedgers. And so, um, and so anyways, uh, over the past five years, that's sort of the range, you know, for gold producers and users, positive 1%, negative 30%. Okay, so where does this current figure fall? Negative 24%. It falls on the lower end of the range. And so, um, let me change that up. Uh, so like right here, the current percentile is uh, is 20%. So that means that if this five-year uh, positioning percentile is 100%, that would mean that producers and users had never been this you know net bullish over the past five years. So 100% is an extreme reading on the bullish end. But on the uh, lower end, 0% zero, zero would mean that producers and users have never been this net short over the past 10 years. And so, um, for example, you know, right now, if uh, producers and users came in and they got, you know, short negative 30.8% of the open interest, boom, the five-year percentile goes to 0%, so it's super net short. But right now, um, it's about 20%, so that's the five-year percentile. So yeah. how I sort of show this is here's that five-year percentile, it's the green line on my website. So we got, we're looking at gold, we're looking at you know net positioning adjusted for open interest, and the green line is producers and users. So, um, what's sort of interesting in gold right now is that uh, gold producers and users are actually more net short now at lower prices than they were last summer when gold was in the mid 1300s. And so that's sort of you know an interesting thing. But uh, how would you do? Would you interpret that as uh, a bearish signal for gold, or or what? So yeah, uh, overall, if yeah, if you if you take two prices and right now you know gold's price is lower, and you're telling me that the people who know the most about that commodity, you know, gold producers and users, right. are more net short now. They want to hedge more now. 
obviously you need to incorporate other stuff, but um, right. you know, producer positioning right now in gold does lean, you know, slightly bearish. Okay. Uh, but but let me show you. So now I've sort of outlined, you know, what the CO2 report is, uh, how how you need to look at the past, how you need to adjust it for open interest. Let me show you how to actually make make it actionable information because I think a lot of people screw up um, interpreting COT. So a lot of I also people, wanted to ask you, Adam, uh, do you find it useful for currencies? Oh, a absolutely. So now some okay. people on the surface will say, "Hang on, you know." COT data only covers uh, futures and options positions on currencies. You know, that's just a drop in the bucket relative to, you know, the gigantic Forex and OTC right. market. And that's absolutely right. And it is also the same case with, um, you know, stocks and bonds. But um, the positioning in those financial futures is representative of sort of the larger, you know, pond. And I found that COT, it honestly works the best in my opinion in commodities where it is the primary market but it definitely is still worth paying attention to in financial futures anyway so okay. um so yeah so let me explain sort of how i think about it uh how i think about cot so a lot of people just take extreme positioning at face value so for example uh let's look at something like coffee uh in 2012. so this white line is speculator so it's that same metric I just walked through, but it sort of uh, aggregates together the uh, money managers, other reportables, non-reportables into one category, takes a net position, adjusts it for OI, and shows you a percentile. So white line, speculators. So um, in 2012, uh, speculators, like right here, November 2012, speculators were more net short coffee futures than they had ever been over the past five years. So I assure you, and I remember back then, a lot of people were writing about it. They were saying, you know, wow, traders are massively short coffee. It's a crowded short position. Fade it. You know, this is, this is going to be a firework when it explodes. And what did coffee end up doing? It kept on going down. And it's, that makes sense because think about this. So who was in this trade when coffee was going down? A lot of trend followers. Trend followers, uh, you know, price sort of governs what they do. And so if they're short coffee, and coffee does nothing but go down, they have no incentive to cover their short. You know, they're, they're, they're making money. And so um, I think it's really important not to just sort of uh, immediately want to fade extreme spec positioning. Think about it. What's going to cause people to really react? It's when they start to fall under pressure. Uh, so it's sort of like a fire in the theater situation of, uh, net crowded like net short positioning for coffee really didn't matter until coffee caught a huge bid okay so when coffee started so going was, up so it, it didn't matter for a year and by then you're broke exactly exactly and so if you would have solely looked at coffee and said okay everybody's short i'm gonna fade it i'm gonna get long no quick way to lose money but if you look at it sort of you need to take in a second dimension if you say okay you know positioning super short but they really don't have an incentive until price starts to put them under pressure, go the other way. I'm going to keep an eye on coffee. And when it starts to, you know, stage a technical breakout, then, you know, that totally could be a big explosive trade to the upside. And that is what happened with coffee. It, it was, it was a massive rip in early 2014. It's because there was so much money on the short side that it was like a massively lopsided thing. And so, um, and so that's sort of how I like to, to think about it. another good example was a uh, palladium so pal i don't know if you've traded palladium this year but palladium yeah. has been a Man. massive massive move this year and yeah. it was all rooted in uh early to mid 2016 speculators were really really short uh palladium but it the rally never really got legs until you know it, it truly broke out and it went from you know 546 to now it's basically a thousand dollars an ounce and so this this entire rally was sort of rooted in um, speculators being more net short than they had ever been over the past five years. So I think it's really important to pair positioning with technicals. If you have crowded, you know, spec short long positioning, but, you know, the price has just been dripping down. It's still in a confirmed downtrend. You, you can't fade that. You can't do that. But if you um, if they start to diverge, then you've got something. And so now, it puts it on it puts it on the radar screen. But again, price action is king. Exactly. And so I will say this though, COT is a good shortcut to sort of 
it, it's sort of two things. It's a good shortcut that maybe prevents you from getting into a crowded boat. So for example, um, with, let me scroll. What's a, let's see what's a crowded trade right now. Something like uh, heating oil, to be honest. Okay, so heating oil uh, in a lot of, you know, the, the petroleum products have been doing well, uh, yeah. but heating oil is a very crowded trade that not a lot of people are talking about. So speculators are extremely net long. Okay, so the last time, there were this net long was in early 2017, and you can see that price sort of stalled out around there. So right. what I'm getting at is COT is effective for two things. What if you know I was running a strategy and it called for me going long heating oil? Well, I could sort of gut check uh, the COT position, and say, oh wow, you know everybody's long right now. Maybe I want to trade smaller size with this, or maybe I just don't want to take that long trade at all. So it's it's a good sort of. Uh, sort of gut check for avoiding crowded positioning. But then secondly, like I said, with the um, sort of the other side, the fading crowded positioning, it works really well to, uh, to identify when something could ma like be a massive, um, I don't know, uh, rip in the other direction. The best example of that I've seen probably this year was orange juice. So <laughs> uh, going into the hurricane season, <laughs> speculators yeah. were more net short than they had ever been over five years. What do we have? We had huge scares about, you know, the Florida crop. Right. And so, right. uh, you know, orange juice were up 30, 40 percent. And so that was a perfect example of sort of uh, crowded speculator positioning being the, the kindling and then price going the other way being the, the fire that sort of, uh, I don't know, lit it. And Great so, metaphor. Yeah, yeah. And so overall, um, now you're probably scrolling through all this and you're like, OK, this is a, a ton of data. Uh, let's uh, let's sort of make it concise. So what I did is on my website, uh, um, I just have a dashboard page. And what it is, is remember when I sort of talked about that five-year percentile metric, you know, for the, the different yeah. trader categories, this shows you that number for all the markets, for the different categories. So for example, this graph shows you, you know, the five-year net percentile for speculators in commodities. So remember, 100% super net long, 0% super net short. And then I'll also do that for um, speculators in financial futures, you know, commodity hedgers. And so right now with speculators, here's sort of an overview. So there's super long livestock, um, like heater cattle, live cattle, yeah. like I showed you, heating oil. Um, and also really long copper, uh, palladium. But on the short side, um, they're really short, soft commodities, sure. so like sugar, sugar and coffee. coffee. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of agricultural is like corn and wheat too. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's sort of commodities. Let's look at financial futures. So what's positioning like? All right, so we are super long uh, Euro US dollar, the Nikkei, Dow Jones, uh, Canadian US dollar. There's not a ton of contracts that are short, um, but they're really short Swiss franc against the dollar, the yen against the dollar, and the Euro dollar actually, like the, the bond contract, not the currency. And so, right. um, so an overview of this is it's 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 no new information to you. It's you know it's still people betting on a weaker dollar. I like the way you really present it, it though. It's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really nice and then, job. Yeah, and then finally with uh, hedgers, which sort of like the the smart money and commodity markets. It's think about it. It's going to be the inverse of spec position. So what are hedgers super long? Uh, and remember, hedgers being long implies that not a lot of producers are selling because they don't want to lock in current prices because prices are low, but you do have a ton of users buying because they're like, oh, prices are low. I want to fix the cost of my future inventory at these currently low levels. So right now, uh, commodity hedgers, they're really net long in the soft commodities like coffee, um, sugar, and also the agriculturals like wheat and corn. And so it's sort of the inverse of spec positioning, um, but, that's sort of a sort of an overview, and that's sort of how I make sense of uh, of the COT. So, what questions do you have for me? Okay, well, my partner Steve Volge has one for you. Go ahead, Steve. Hey, Adam. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question for you. Um, is it actionable? Is it usable for you to take the difference between the positioning of uh, speculators and commercials? Because no. I, I see you showing the percentiles for each yeah. category, but I'm wondering if extreme uh, divergence between the two, because I, I saw in some of the charts you presented before, 
uh, I mean, they might have uh, the, 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 the differences between them might have been on occasion like smaller or, or bigger. Does that yeah. produce an action, actionable signal uh, on occasion? Yeah, so I've, I've looked into that and remember the only thing that would cause sort of a gap. So what would make this a perfectly inverse sort of two graphs is if I included analysis of swap dealers uh, in either category. And that's solely the difference. That's the difference between the two. And so if you want to sort of isolate the difference between, you know, spec and producer positioning, swap dealers would do it. And like I said, swaps, they're not a reliable trader category in that, you know, as producers and users, you always know those are, you know, people with an actual interest in the underlying commodity. Uh, and on the flip side, speculators are always sort of trading on their own behalf. But with swap dealers, you never really know. And so, um, I've, I've sort of examined it, looking at the, the divergence between the two, and there's not a lot of noise in that signal. But here's one thing I will talk about is, um, so these markets are different in sort of the makeup. So let me give you an example. With like natural gas, that market is dominated by speculators. They're like more than 80% of the open interest. But a smaller market like uh, oats um, is, and nobody trades that stuff, but a smaller market like oats is dominated by producers because you don't you don't hear about a lot of speculators trading oats and also you can't trade a lot of size in that market so it discourages yeah, like hedge funds and so um but here's what i'm getting at is i've noticed that with these smaller markets that are dominated by the um by the producers and users cot report tends to give uh really useful signals in these less liquid markets so for example um earlier this year speculators were super net long oat futures and then on the flip side of the trade producers were happily hedging so every time a spec was bending it up uh oat producers were saying you know give more to me I, I would love to fix you know the price for my my current crop at current prices and so um all i'm saying is that when uh a market is more controlled by the producers and users i've found the positioning to be less noisy and less sort of a, a whipsaw type thing but when you're talking about yeah, so when you're talking about markets like uh, I'm trying to think like natural gas, crude oil, gold, all these honestly those are spec dominated markets. Um, you just got to be careful because if you're looking at so for example, if you're looking at uh, producer and user position in nat gas, you sort of at first glance you're like okay, I'm you know I'm paying attention to the smart money, and you are to a degree. But if the smart money is only a fraction of the open interest, they're not the people controlling that market, and so it's important to sort of to know that. Yes. What a great interview. What a great interview. And you know, oats are a very good technical market. I, as a commodity broker, I used to love to trade oats. You know, Adam, yeah. uh, I've never seen a better expl uh, explanation and uh, detail on COT before. And uh, I really appreciate you coming in today. Uh, we're getting, uh, you know, the best way to follow Adam is his Twitter handle is at movement capital is that also the name of your website yeah let me uh let me pull it up so i think okay. right here yeah okay so this is my twitter and uh and like throughout the week i'll tweet out like you know some of these positioning charts and so yeah. that's my twitter and then my website is um movement.capital and i've also got a bunch okay. of other free tools that uh that people can use so yeah, oh, that's yeah. Me. And i see that like seasonality yeah, yeah. Um, is that kind of like uh, Jack, uh, Jake Bernstein stuff? But you, are you a big believer in seasonality? So I think that no, I'm not. I'm not the type of person to put on a trade, you know, June, like June 14th every year because it's worked okay. the past seven years. I think that uh, <laughs> I think it is important to remain cognizant of. Uh, and so yeah. how I show seasonality is, you know, simple five, 10, 20 year averages average monthly right. performance, and I also like to look at term structure. And so, uh, you know, I've got, that's free too. But, uh, but no, Dale, I really, I really enjoyed it. I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions if people email me or whatever. And so uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad that you, uh, you know, accepted my invitation and uh, great work. And uh, I, I'm, it was great to hear your story and uh, you're very fortunate to end up uh, right out of college, uh, right out the gate, you know, like a horse, uh, <laughs> getting right on the, tr getting right on the track and providing a great service to traders. So congratulations yeah, well, to you, Adam. 
Well, thanks a ton. I appreciate it. And you have a good rest of the day. All right, partner. There's my yeah. trading warrior brother, Adam, and you can follow him at Movement Capital. And that's going to be a wrap for us, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Alina. Good question, Steve Volge. Blake, thank you. Stelios, thank you. Don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And I'll see everyone for What the Heck Wednesday, tomorrow. Adios, my trading warrior brothers and sisters. See you tomorrow. You're very welcome, Duran.